All right, so let's get started. Welcome everyone to the HNRCA Monday seminar series. We have a very special seminar today. Um, uh, our speaker is from the HNRCA. Um, and because of that, uh, Dr. Sue Roberts will be introducing our presenter. Uh, so go ahead, Sue. Thank you, Catherine. It's my, it's my pleasure and my joy to introduce Dr. Cy Das. Cy came to my lab in 1996 to do a PhD at Tufts University, and she stayed to do a postdoc. And she has moved through the system um, she's uh, she's a, she's a fully independent scientist, so she's she's a trainee who I'm incredibly proud of. Um, she's published more than 100 research papers. She's now the rising co-chair of Nutrition for Precision Health, um, one of our flagship NIH projects in the building. Um, she sits on the calorie steering committee and she's leading the calorie follow up. And she's also now on the standing committee for the DRIs. Sai has, you know, is a is one of Tufts stars graduates. She's really making a difference to world nutrition through all of the important research that she's now doing independently. So I'm delighted to welcome her and congratulate her on all of the success that uh, she's been she's been having. Sai, over to you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, for your mentorship and colleagueship over the last 20 years. I appreciate it. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone, for joining uh, me today in this webinar. Um, it's been my lifetime work, but I appreciate you sharing um, your time to listen in. And uh, I'm going to be focusing, as is titled, on dietary interventions for metabolic health and aging, the need for precision. I am not going to make a separate case, but as I present, I will show you uh, where we might need to start thinking about the nuances of what we're observing and, and why you know, precision approaches are needed. But primarily, I'm going to start with making a case for why dietary interventions in aging, and then talk about a landmark um, study and also where the research is heading in terms of dietary interventions for aging. All right, so um, we know that population aging is real, and this is because increased life expectancy has led to a number of older adults living with age-related pathologies. What this has done is um, it's basically led to an increased burden on the healthcare systems, and it's not something that's a transient sort of trend or observation in the demographics. We do know that by 2035, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, the number of older adults you know, defined as uh, those with um, a chronological age of 65 plus and older will outnumber the number of children. And so essentially um, geriatric care will need to be um, a, a, a sort of priority both for the healthcare systems as well as for all of the public health approaches. In addition to population aging, age alone or age itself is um, an independent risk factor for many of the chronic diseases um, that we do see with um, as, as we grow older. And this is very nicely illustrated in this graph. And between 40 to 60 years, somewhere um, in that age range, there is also sort of an exponential increase in, in, in you know, the increase for risk and in, in acquiring chronic diseases. So age um, is, is not just um, a chronological sort of number that changes, but it in, brings with it disease risk. And um, that is an important co context to keep in mind. But when, he, when we think of aging, we think of um, aging uh, as two sort of uh, domains of aging. The first being primary aging, which is the inevitable deterioration of cells and tissue structures and function that occur independent of disease and lifestyle. Basically that external factors are not playing into this uh, primary aging process and it's cellular aging that, that basically determines maximal lifespan. And there is also what's called secondary aging, which is entirely dependent on these external factors such as lifestyle behaviors um, and you know, social behaviors as well that really um, feed into accelerated, um, in this case, deterioration of cellular um, and tissue structure and function. So secondary aging determines mean lifespan. 
for us as nutrition scientists, the excitement is basically um, because we know now that we've always known that dietary and other lifestyle factors could uh, impact secondary aging, but we know now that primary aging can be in fact impacted or affected with um, nutritional interventions. And that is where the context of nutritional modulation of aging really um, is both promising and exciting. So uh, the big question is, can we stop aging? And there are some um, scientists in, in, in the field of aging who do believe that it indeed can be stopped. But I think the majority do know um, that at least we can perhaps um, you know, slow it down. And this is um, sort of where uh, we and all the work that we do is really heading, which is basically in um, bringing in lifestyle changes for attenuating aging. So this field is called the nutritional modulation of aging and um, early work showed that dietary restriction per se reduces the rate of biological aging in a variety of species, including in rodents and non-human primates. And the term caloric restriction or calorie restriction is specifically reserved for the consumption, uh, for the process by which consumption of fewer calories occurs in an individual. Um, and this consumption is lower than what one habitually eats without compromising diet quality. And that's really important because that is a distinction. It's eating fewer calories, but nutritionally adequate um, calories uh, being part of the intake and sustaining this practice um, over the lifetime with a simple goal or the single goal, pardon me, of um, attenuating aging. Now, not for weight loss and for other um, potential aesthetic um, outcomes, but basically for attenuating aging. So this is uh, what CR refers to, and, and when we refer to calorie restriction or CR, that is what we're talking about. And like I said, um, it was shown that calorie restriction works in a variety of species, um, in, you know, and including um, worms, yeast, and uh, up to rodents. And this early work was established by Dr. Um, Clive McKay, and, and he showed back in 1936 in rodents that rodents who are calorically restricted are basically resistant to age-related diseases, um, have lower blood glucose and insulin, have increased number of um, activity or mitochondrial activity was improved, and are um, and were also resistant to stress. So essentially, um, the cumulative sort of uh, effect of these different metabolic and health-related um, changes increase both mean lifespan as well as maximum uh, lifespan. And this was very elegantly demonstrated by the work that. Dr. McKay did. And this um, was, was exciting and promising for the field of um, nutritional interventions for attenuating aging. The work that was subsequently done in non-human primates, as you know, they share um, a biology that is very close to humans uh, and the non-human primates in this case, who are the rhesus monkeys. And there were two seminal cohorts that basically contributed to all of the um, information or two cohorts that contributed to all the seminal information in this field. And um, the first of them was the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center cohort. Um, the monkeys in this case were 30% calorically restricted and the caloric restriction was provided um, between the ages of seven to 14. So basically when uh, the monkeys were younger. Um, there's also the, the work that is done by the National Institute of Aging cohort, where there were, um, you know, again, 30% calorically restricted monkeys, but there was an early onset and late onset cohort. But first, the Wisconsin uh, National Primate Research Monkeys um, were, was, you know, so, something that was the first ever, um, you know, non-human primate data that came out. And what it basically showed is that there was a clear and marked, um, you know, distinction between the calorically restricted monkeys that not only looked better, but also felt better compared to the control monkeys. And here is the data that you have seen in some of the other uh, presentations as well along um, this, these lines. But basically the percent of mon percentage of monkeys that uh, survived were um, far greater in the colloquially restricted group shown in red uh, compared to the controls uh, who were on ad libitum diet. And also the percentage of uh, monkeys without age-related disease was higher in the calorically restricted group um, compared to the control. So essentially what it pointed out to is um, a great uh, lifespan benefit as well as what we call health span benefit um, that is remaining without disease. So that's the uh, Wisconsin cohort data and um, the National Institute of Aging data, again, the same 30% restriction was provided to these monkeys. However, like I said, there was an early onset and a late onset um, sort of cohort within, within the NIA monkeys. 
And um, this data basically also showed clear differences, um, both in appearance between the calorie restricted and the controlled monkeys. But what it did show is that, you know, the distinction for clear lifestyle, lifespan benefits were not so, um, you know, marked, you know, the in both in the young cohort and the old cohort. Here you will see the dotted lines are the females and the solid lines are the males. And there was some separation for males and females, but not really in terms of uh, lifespan benefits um, related outcomes for between the calorie restricted and the control monkeys. Um, however, this data from the NIA cohort also showed that there were clear benefits with regards to health span or the proportion without age-related disease. And again, you can see that the calorie restricted cohort was basically, um, you know, had a had a lower proportion um, without uh, had a higher proportion of monkeys without age related disease, um, and the controls um, were clearly distinguished from the CR group for this outcome. So what it basically showed is that you know there were clear health span benefits that were observed in, in this cohort, in the NIA cohort, and it was true for both the young and the old onset. Regardless, the lifespan differences led this um, you know, group of researchers, both from the Wisconsin and the NIA co uh, cohorts to come together to do an in-depth comparison as to why some of these differences between the two cohorts may be um, attributed to and what factors may have contributed to some of these discrepancies or differences in the results. And they found that, you know, first of all, even though both cohorts were 30% calorically restricted, the Wisconsin monkeys were fed an ad libitum diet, whereas the NIA monkeys were fed, um, they were not restricted, but they were fed, um, you know, energy requirement related um, a diet. Also, the quality of the diet was very different. The Wisconsin monkeys had a semi-purified diet, whereas the NIA monkeys had a diet that was very uh, natural and, and uh, close to wholesome and with micronutrient and phytochemicals as well as trace minerals and all of those balanced well within their diet that was provided. Um, the type of starch uh, was corn starch in the Wisconsin monkeys, whereas it was wheat, corn, and sucrose um, mixed for the NIA monkeys in different proportions. And likewise for protein sources, it was um, closer to more natural sources, whereas um, the Wisconsin monkeys had lactalbumin and um, also for fat and other compositions. And remember, there was also an age of onset difference between the two. And finally, um, the country of origin for the Wisconsin monkeys was pure. It was from um, just India, whereas it was uh, much more mixed for the NIA cohort. What this points to is that there are all of these factors that need to be considered, not only from a translation perspective, but also from an interpretation perspective with regards to you know, precision approaches, um, to matching what's best in terms of outcomes and metabolic health for um, not just primates, but also in um, non-human primates, but also for human primates. So um, that's pretty much what is summarized here. Basically, there was this age of onset difference, feeding protocol difference, diet composition difference, and genetic origin, as well as, um, you know, other factors that, you know, the, the, the biological sex and other that fed um, to, to, you know, the observed differences between the two groups. The um, rhesus monkey studies are therefore valuable for connecting some of the mechanistic studies in invertebrates, so bridging both um, you know, the invertebrates to human primates and, and allowing for mechanistic understanding of some of um, the conservation of roles of putative longevity factors that will translate directly to human aging and human health. And ongoing research is, is, um, is basically going to produce some of these um, factors that are, you know, um, along the lines of precision factors in aging that are not evident from, in, uh, not just the individual cohorts, but also the individual studies. So we move on to uh, looking at what's known in humans. And um, of course, I always uh, like to bring this slide up, which basically was on all the mugs we provided in calories. Back then, Ben Franklin had said to lengthen thy life, lessen thy meals. But um, in our scientific investigation and pursuits, we always do rigorous experimentation to en ensure that proof of concept is established. And um, that is pretty much what will be the focus of the rest of my talk. But there were also, at the time um, that we embarked on um, more rigorous studies, some observational um, studies that did show that there was uh, this population of Okinawans who are basically, um, you know, the, uh, Okinawa is an island off of the mainland of Japan and, and the Okinawans 
had a greater proportion of centenarians, um, you know, that being made it to that chronological age compared to their counterparts, both in Japan and all of the uh, Western counterparts as well. And that's shown here basically in the graph to the right. And um, you can see the United States is in the bottom in yellow and Okinawa is up there in red. And, and the, the most important comparison is um, the Japanese counterparts of the Okinawans in the mainland of Japan. So they did um, outlive um, the, these other um, comparative cohorts and it was established that their diet was restricted by approximately 20%. Um, I am reading an interesting book called the Ikigai, which basically, you know, points out to some of these precision um, approaches that we apply um, in science, where it's not just the diet, but also, you know, what else is happening in their lifestyle, their contextual and behavioral and other factors. And, and, and you know, the Okinawans were also known to be um, very, you know, to keep themselves busy, very community oriented, um, also brewed the special tea um, that they drank. And, and so, while we absolutely do know that um, caloric restriction was a big part of their lifestyle, there are also these other uh, factors that, you know, the relative contribution of which needs to be determined. And, and these are all the types of thinking that go into precision nutrition. But basically from a human studies perspective, the observation in the Okinawan centenarians and, and their overall longevity, um, and the fact that they were, um, you know, energy restricted, really helped with um, sort of further um, strengthening the CR um, you know, investigations. In addition, um, we have some very good biological sort of uh, data on um, the Ansel Key studies with regards to human starvation and, and what the physiology of you know, both the fasted state and, and other um, would be. And there was an invert, inadvertent CR experimentation with the Biosphere 2 and Roy Walford. The Biosphere was essentially designed to be a self-containing ecosystem where food was supposed to be grown um, and, and people were um, looking at sustainability and other sort of goals. And what happened was um, inadvertently, they were not able to produce the amount of food that was needed to sustain the individuals and, um, and therefore they um, were calorically restricted. And interesting blood and other data from the biospherians showed that they were um, you know, indeed much more metabolically um, healthy. And, and so this sort of also led support to the concept of caloric restriction. And finally, um, you know, um, there is this group called the calorie restricted, um, the cronies or the cat, which stands for crone or calorie restriction with optimal nutrition. And the cronies um, essentially um, are a voluntary group of um, individuals who practice caloric restriction. And um, Luigi Fontana did some studies where he compared the calorically restricted cronies to age match controls. And that's what's shown in this table. If you look at um, age match controls versus the cronies or the CR um, practicing individuals, they essentially had parameters that were um, way um, better for metabolic health and risk factors that were close to 10 year olds and for blood pressure and other such factors and lipid profiles that were um, you know, closer to 20 year olds. So Given that you know, these observations were strikingly different from their um, control counterparts, it was pointed out that you know, caloric restriction can be um, sustained and may have beneficial effects. And one of the criticisms that we've often got is that, well, maybe these people were like ultra healthy and, and, and really um, you know, um, a special cohort of individuals. Um, and that's not entirely the case. If we look at the cronies prior to their um, you know, undertaking caloric restriction, their um, values for most of these parameters were closer to the control um, rather than um, you know, closer to where they um, were with the comparisons with the age match control. So essentially this was, there was nothing super special about this cohort. They did have values that um, pretty much are normal for 50 year olds um, or, or a normal cohort of 50 year olds, but they did have with caloric restriction all these marked improvements. So um, these were sort of the, the landscape and the background that led to the first um, calorie restricted um, tri human trials. Um, this is a, a randomized control trial and it's termed calorie. And, and please note, it's comprehensive assessment for long-term effects of reducing intake of energy. And that's why it's calorie and not um, spelled calorie as, is, as we are often corrected. And um, Calorie was uh, supported by the National Institute of Aging, our, um, our funding source, and was conducted in two phases, the pilot phase and um, a main study. 
for the pilot phase, these were studies that were short term and site specific. And I, and I say site specific because there were three sites um, that participated in Calorie. This included our site here at the HNRCA, um, the Jamaya USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging, um, the Washington State University in St. Louis School of Medicine, and the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. So these were the three um, sites that participated in this multi-site trial. And um, NIA sponsored it and a clinical coordinating center was at Duke uh, and still is. So the studies basically, like I said, in the pilot phase were short-term. And the goal of these short-term studies was essentially to look at whether CR um, can be sustained in the different approaches. The range of caloric restriction was anywhere from 20% to 30% at our site and um, Pennington did um, 25%. And the studies included diet composition, which we did here, a combination of CR and exercise for the same 25%, that's 12.5% CR and 12.5% um, exercise or pure CR through diet. And then WashU um, has ex exercise expertise as well. And so they did a pure exercise arm and a CR arm and basically at the end of um, this study, the results showed marked beneficial, be beneficial effects in a variety of metabolic parameters. Um, and um, you know, some cautionary sort of tales with regards to lean body mass and um, lower body strength. Again, these were absolute, but not um, adjusted changes were not so bad, but um, monitoring for bone mineral density was one of the flags that was raised. But essentially what we did show is a variety of beneficial effects for metabolically speaking, but one of the things that clearly was pointed out is if you look at um, the exercise arm, it didn't do way better than the CR arm. So a pure um, exercise approach for caloric restriction was not favored and CR by diet um, with not too much emphasis on diet composition or a combination of diet and exercise, um, again, for sustaining CR was the goal. So basically we uh, came up with the recommendation that dietary restriction as the CR approach was the way to go and that longer term data was needed. And this led to um, the main study, which was a common protocol across the three sites. And the common protocol um, examined the effects of two years of caloric restriction. Um, the level of caloric restriction that was chosen was a 25% calorie restriction. And um, we examined the effect of this level of CR on markers of longevity, metabolism, and biological function. So here's a quick overview on the study design. Um, you know, we had 220 healthy individuals by healthy. I mean that the body mass index of um, these um, participants were, was within the range of 22 to 28. So basically without obesity, uh, we had an age range of 21 to 50 for men and 21 to 47 for females because we wanted to um, rule out any confounding by perimenopausal effects. And the randomization was in um, a ratio of two to one in favor of caloric restriction for every person randomized to the control group. There were two that were randomized to the CR group and it was stratified by site, uh, the three sites, um, biological sex and BMI, normal weight to overweight. Remember that was the range of BMI. So this is basically what the study design was and um, the emphasis is on participants without obesity who were extensively screened and enrolled for this two year um, study. Um, we did not have objective markers to track adherence on an ongoing basis. The participants were not provided food, but were counseled using individual and group sessions. But what we did have is a computerized tracking system that was informed by a model that was basically predicted using data from the pilot phase. And what this model um, or the computerized tracking system did was to create for each individual, a band, which um, the lower uh, range of which was the 10th percentile, which means that a participant was um, over restricting themselves if they were below this 10th percentile, and an 80th percentile, which was the upper limit of the band, which basically suggested that participants were um, probably not restricting themselves as much as they should. So the trajectory was basically the median and guidance was provided to stay within the zone and, and try to stay um, as much as possible closer to the median. So the zone of acceptable weight, remember weight was not a goal, but it was used as an adherence monitoring um, you know, tool to keep people within the zone. And I point this out simply because we um, have some notes on precision and other that I will um, you know, point out to you in the subsequent slides, but this is what we had to help people stay on their 25% calorie restriction prescription. So what did um, we achieve by way of percent calorie restriction? We had 
um, over the two year period, which is what is shown here on the X axis, an average of 12% that was achieved um, uh, over the long term. And in the early uh, months, we uh, had about 20%, which then tapered off to 15 and, uh, and then closer to 10 to 12 for an average of nine um, to 10% in, in, uh, in the next one and a half years after the first six months. So essentially average of 12% over the two years and uh, with good um, indication of 20% in the early six months. There was also um, a huge variability though with regards to the percentage uh, caloric restriction and that's what's um, shown here. And you'll see the CR group had anywhere um, up to 35 even to almost close to nothing. And in the control group as well, they were not purely um, in, in the control state. And this is the 12 month data. And also you will see for the 24 month data, the same variability was observed. And um, this is because we had, like I said, these modeling systems um, that really helped them stay within the zone. But we did find out after um, we completed the trial and did uh, a retrospective, a, a prospective analysis, um, a postdoc analysis, pardon me, that the calorically restricted group was um, on average closer to 15% at the 12 month. Uh, and, and like I said, the 12% um, at 24 months. Um, and closer really to where we were calling it um, the 80th percentile mark, right? So they were not staying closer to the median, but closer to this point and basically staying within the zone for sure. Um, and what, what I'm trying to say here is that there might have been um, a guidance related, um, you know, confounding here with regards to the percentage that was achie achieved. And it is not true that, you know, uh, no one could achieve 25%. Um, so this points out to um, you know, the modeling that we do and um, how these models need to be more precise in order for us to not only make precise infer inferences, but also to guide uh, people with regards to what they should be doing for their optimal metabolic health. And if you could um, look at this figure as well, this um, you know, percentage um, caloric restriction was closer to the 80th percentile for those with normal weight, um, and closer to the median for those with overweight and, and all of these lessons, um, as well as differences that we observe with race and, uh, and, and biological sex that I'm not showing you here in the interest of time, are all pointing out to the fact that we do need precision tools and precision approaches to be able to um, get the best uh, metabolic uh, benefits for individuals for whatever um, you know, dietary approaches we're using. Back to the results of um, the, uh, the two-year calorie restriction trial, we did not find um, any um, sort of long-term adaptation in resting metabolic rate, which supports what's called the, um, you know, the rate of living theory, which is implicated as one of the ways in which aging is attenuated. However, we did find um, at the total daily energy expenditure level, some adaptation um, in, 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 in overall energy expenditure. Um, these were, by the way, the resting metabolic rate was the primary outcome. We did, however, find very um, strong, you know, and, and marked benefits in cardiometabolic outcomes for all of the lipid parameters, blood pressure, as well as for, um, you know, insulin resistance as measured by um, HOMA IR. And these um, cardiometabolic benefits were um, all achieved at that 12% caloric restriction. We also noticed that um, you know, there were uh, marked improvements uh, and, or decreases in oxidative stress in the calorically restricted groups con control to, compared to the controls. And this was measured by isoprostanes and um, a variety of the forms of isoprostanes were measured. And they clearly and equivocally showed that there was a reduction in oxidative stress. Um, an area um, of um, great interest, as you know, as we age is inflammaging or uh, in inflammation and immunity. What uh, we did look at is IGF-1 and binding proteins. No significant changes were observed in IGF-1, which is one of the candidate markers, um, but there was a significant decrease in the ratio of IGF-1 and binding proteins. Um, there were marked improvements in all of the inflammatory markers showing a reduction in circulating levels, um, including for total WBC, lymphocyte, ICAM, and leptin and a significant decrease in CRP, uh, approximately 40% decrease in the CR group compared to controls and TNF-alpha. However, um, we didn't see marked improvements in some of the markers in the main trial, but what we did, um, and these were measured by um, delayed uh, type hypersensitivity skin responses and antibody response to titers uh, and vaccines. However, um, a subsequent, subsequent secondary analysis showed that um, 
by Spadaro et al. showed that in humans, CR preserves thymic volume, and I'm no expert on thymic volume, but what they basically showed is that CD4 and CD8 T cell production is preserved, suggesting that the effects of CR are protective. The thymus, as you know, is a key tissue for T cell maturation and shrinkage of the thymus, which begins usually in middle age, blunts immune surveillance. And so this is really um, an important finding that you know, also points out to looking at a variety of markers and mechanisms uh, within a, a system such as immunity or inflammation um, for signatures of both cellular and molecular changes that may support attenuation of aging. Um, Spadara et al. also went on to profile uh, to do some gene expression and they profiled adipose tissue from people undergoing CR and identified reduced expression of platelet activating factor acetyl hydrolase. Now, um, PL, PLA 2G7 is poised at the intersection of metabolism and immunity and could be a valuable target for correction of immunometabolic dysfunction. There's some um, great um, editorial as well as uh, the paper for those of you who are interested in looking. Um, at this a little more uh, for your own, um, you know, hypotheses and, and investigations. Um, one of the very exciting uh, findings for us is, is uh, the demonstration that, you know, actually biological aging is attenuated with this two years of caloric restriction. Uh, the approach that was used is the Clamora Dubal biological age. And using this, Dr. Belsky and um, his team showed that the calorie restricted group had an attenuated aging uh, rate. And um, this is in comparison to the control groups, both at 12 months and at 24 months, basically the one and two year mark. Um, they went on to uh, more recently do some further investigation with regards to the pace of aging, static and dynamic measures. And they uh, found that, that even um, though there was not much of a sort of marked increase in the pheno age and the grim age, which are uh, sort of more uh, static measures of aging, the pace of aging as measured by the Dunedin pace of aging marker um, showed that there was marked decrease in the CR group only. But what I also want to highlight is that, you know, the left panel here shows that there's not, you know, one single line where everybody overlaps um, everyone else. And, and there's a lot, um, as you can see, of variability that is de depicted in this traffic here um, in the left in the left panels, and that you know is something that um, needs to be looked into as to who benefits great more from um, such interventions and what may be some of the nuances as well as um, support systems that could be put in place uh, for improving or maximizing the benefits of aging and, um, and caloric restriction. So in sum, I wanna point out that with that 12% caloric restriction, there were system-wide benefits that were observed. Um, there was a decrease in biological age and, and multiple systems that were positively impacted um, with, with the overarching goal that biological aging uh, was slowed or reduced using these markers as indicators of aging. So um, with that, I wanna point out that there's always been a dialogue that perhaps continuous calorie restriction or CR is not for all, and there may be other, um, you know, approaches and, and perhaps a need for a alternative, um, you know, processes and systems that need to be looked into. And, and this sort of thinking is not just um, from lessons that we have learned with calorie restriction, but also because there's data that has been shown both in rodents and now um, in humans that Maybe we should be looking at eating timing or um, you know, investigate if it's really the actual caloric deficit or the duration of fast that really uh, confers these benefits. And if there is a synergistic effect of the two or if there are independent um, effects or if one is more important than the other. And the early work that um, was again, an accidental finding with the CR rodents was that these rodents, when they were given their food, ate very quickly and ate sort of within an hour or so. Um, and then, then this led to an inadvertent experiment of having a longer duration of fast, which is close to a 23 hour period. And so this, um, this sort of observation led to the question as to whether it's the calorie restriction or the fasting that was conferring the benefits. We also know now that fasting results in a switch from carbohydrate to fatty acid met metabolism, which is um, known to be metabolically beneficial and healthy. And um, also um, the rodent studies of alternate day fasting showed um, another possible um, caveat, which is basically that animals who ate um, ad libitum on the alternate days when they were not fasting, ended up consuming just as many calories as the control animals in some for the week. And so we don't want this fast and feast sort of being 
um, you know, something that attenuates all of the benefits of caloric restriction because in, in, in effect, you know, we are not calorically restricted and we end up feasting and making up for the fasted day. So these are all important, um, both precision as well as, um, you know, approach related considerations that need to be, um, you know, kept in mind when designing intervention as well as uh, understanding what the results and um, the observations are basically uh, telling us. There are um, a variety of approaches now uh, that have um, been tested um, in humans. They, they are, um, you know, more short, short term studies and even some leading up to a year. And the long term studies are now underway. But the forms of intermittent fasting um, as alternative approaches to caloric restriction that are being tested include, um, you know, the alternate day fast, where there is, like I said, complete intake on the days um, that is supposed to be uh, the normal days, and then no, uh, no intake at all, a complete fast on the alternative, alter, alternative days as shown here in the blue boxes. So no intake, um, normal intake on the other days that are shown in gray. Um, the modified fast is, is similar to the alternate day fast, except that on the fasted day, um, up to 300 to 400 calories are, uh, are often um, recommended. And so that has um, still sort of shown some benefits. In the alternate day fast, there has been clear um, benefits with um, body composition, lipid profile, um, blood pressure, and, and all of the metabolic syndrome related uh, variables as well as chronic disease risk reduction. But there is um, some concern with the lean mass loss, which seems to be greater in the alternate day fast and the alternate day modified fast regimes compared to um, continuous caloric restriction. There's also the 5-2 diet, which most of you um, have uh, must have heard because it was also very popular in the media. The 5-2 diet consists of eating normally on five days and um, completely fasting or um, having uh, some caloric intake on um, the, the fasted days. So the normal um, eating on, on five days and, um, and on the fast days, complete fast or um, modified caloric intake. And again, this is also up to 300 to 400 calories that is consumed on the, on the so-called fast days for this 5-2. Um, there is a lot of uh, work that's being done to see if these two days need to be consecutive or if it could be um, within the week um, as, as a non-consecutive uh, two-day of fasting. And again, um, this, this form of intermittent fasting has um, shown lower total and visceral adiposity, improvements in liver function, um, and a variety of metabolic uh, benefits, both with either a consecutive or a non-consecutive approach. Again, these are all short-term data that are um, emerging and more work needs to be done for um, long-term um, sort of sustainability as well as metabolic benefits that are sustained over the longer term, but um, there is definitely work that is being done in humans. And, and in one of the upcoming seminars, you will also hear from Dr. Virati um, on the metabolic benefits of um, these types of um, fasting diets um, and intermittent fasting in particular. Um, there's also what's called the fasting mimicking diet, which uh, people um, are mostly undertaking as some sort of a detox as well. That, again, this has been uh, fairly popularized with the fasting mimicking diet. Um, the theory is that you consume a low protein, which um, also has been shown to sort of uh, rub up the protein systems and, 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 and clear some of the, the, the uh, accumulated proteins. And um, the fasting mimicking diet has a signature of low protein, low calories. So the caloric restriction combined with low protein for five consecutive days within uh, a given month, not within a week. And um, this um, regime, like I said, um, it's um, supposed to trigger the metabolic systems to, to, to clear um, accumulated proteins and to essentially rev up uh, metabolism, if you will. Um, the fasting mimicking diet, has been shown to decrease risk factors for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer, basically um, marked improvements in chronic disease risk reduction and, um, and, and, and metabolic benefits. And then there's um, another um, sort of cognitive, you know, um, load decreasing sort of approach, which is the time-restricted eating, where one does not have to do continuous caloric restriction throughout the day, but is in effect eat normally, but eat within, um, uh, a restricted window of time, often six to eight hours being the, the optimal time within which the eating needs to be completed. 
and then um, the remaining hours, of course, being the fasted period. Now, time restricted eating um, has um, there there's benefits that have been shown, but um, also there's there are studies that have not shown a clear benefit. And I, I believe that it's the intervention approach, how it's done, whether it's done with some caloric restriction and, and other that need to be looked into. But time restricted eating has been shown to decrease 24 hour glucose levels, glycemic excursions, so excursions and inflammatory markers have been um, you know, decreased. So these are some of the benefits that have been documented now in the human studies that have been shown. Um, I am certainly not reviewing the landscape of um, all of the work that's been done in rodents, but in humans, these interventions that are alternative approaches to caloric restriction are showing a lot of promise and um, there um, needs to be work that needs to be done for the longer term with regards to how these interventions um, may be suitable for um, either the general or subset of populations for whom um, the benefits are maximized. So uh, we will all need to stay tuned for work that is emerging in this area. And I would like to point out one thing with regards to CR and all of these alternative approaches is that what we are observing is that aging, as was discussed earlier, comes with a variety of um, age-associated deteriorations in cellular function, as well as tissue structure and function, loss of quality of life and, 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 and um, signaling and other uh, pathways. And, and so this, age-associated deterioration is essentially um, you know, overcome, if not completely, um, in, in, in good part by calorie restriction and these different types of uh, fasting regimes, which basically show um, molecular effects that are very positive uh, with regards to cellular mechanisms being um, in, in, you know, showing positive improvements, as well as um, you know, signaling systems that are all in, in favor of attenuated aging as well as physiological improvements, both in quality of life, metabolic uh, function, blood pressure, and, and inflammatory and um, you know, um, immune markers. So this, this um, sort of collective response that we're observing is very much aligned with um, anti-aging or attenuated aging. And, and again, what we call health span improvements and reduction of age-associated parameters. So, um, so like I said, you know, there is a lot of promise. There needs to be a lot more work that's done in particular for humans and, and to see how all of the observations that we're seeing with rodents and other uh, species are translating um, with regards to these um, fasting regimes and work is underway for that. To um, basically conclude, I would like to point out that CR, um, at least from the randomized clinical trials that we have conducted, CR is feasible in humans. This was a big question. And, and now we've uh, equally shown that maybe not at that 25%, but at least for 12%. And, um, and maybe with better guidance, we could have gotten them to um, have um, you know, better um, results with regards to percent calorie restriction achieved at the individual level. But we definitely know it's feasible in humans. Um, and with that 12%, we had uh, remarkable improvements in system-wide um, you know, uh, markers as well as um, system-wide functioning. Um, we do need to, um, as pointed out earlier, look at precision approaches. We have to look at macronutrient composition of the diets that um, they're eating. It's not calorie restriction alone, um, but also eating timing, fasting duration, and other factors, as well as uh, race, ethnicity, gender, biological sex, and um, other parameters that really need to be looked into, as well as the presence or absence of chronic disease. These are certainly areas that require further investigation and, and, and um, studies that need to be conducted specifically for better interpretation for subpopulations. And uh, species-specific and human phenotype-specific variations in calorie restriction and alternative approaches also require further investigation. Uh, we do need to um, be able to demonstrate that across the board and across uh, all human phenotypes that there is, is a clear benefit and that uh, work needs to um, be done. And finally, I think there's so much promise, not only from um, having all of these options, but also um, we have a variety of biomarker and assay tools, um, including omics that can move us towards greater precision in dietary interventions for optimal aging. So um, with that, I really think that, you know, there is so much um, that we know, so much that we've learned, there's so much that is exciting and that's on the horizon uh, for this line of work and, um, and, and basically for optimal aging and improving health span.
here are some of the um, the sort of um, you know leads in terms of future directions. We do have the calorie research network. There's tons of secondary data and sample analyses that are being conducted as part of this network. Um, and opportunities for um, a variety of other questions, mechanistic and otherwise that need to be asked. There's a huge calorie biorepository that, that is now located at the National Institute of Aging, um, NIA Aging Research and Biobank. Um, the data repository is also um, pretty uh, well uh, curated and uh, several ancillary studies are underway but um, have been completed and, and newer ones are on, um, you know, are also emerging and there are working groups so please to let me know or contact anyone for um, you know from the calorie group to to basically um, you know have your questions answered and if you're um, interested in pursuing research please do let us know. I am also leading the um, the calorie legacy study, which is an R01 looking at the calorie participants 10 to 15 years after the completion of the trial. This is an exciting opportunity, and then doing this uh, with multiple principal investigators from the other two sites and. This opportunity allows us to see how much of this calorically restricted lifestyle they are able to follow and um, what are some of the lessons we can learn, but also what are some of these markers that are sustained over the long term. Um, and then there is, like I said, caloric restriction and alternative approaches and longitudinal studies that are being done uh, in the younger cohort at Pennington and in the um, you know, older cohort um, at Wake Forest. And uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge the National Institute on um, Aging for all of the funding support. Uh, it's been 20 years of my life on this work um, and this fascinating and exciting work. And it's really important um, to do everything we can for general protection. Um, I also would like to acknowledge and thank the funding support from the USDA. Um, Dr. Susan Roberts, 20 years ago, um, brought calorie in to the HNRCA. Um, I'm, very um, thankful and grateful. And while I've made it my mission to you know, be immersed in this research, I appreciate that she gave me the opportunity to, to do the work. And um, I also want to uh, you know, thank all of the calorie colleagues and team members at the HNRCA in particular, um, Paul Poos and Ed who are here and, um, and all of our core lab um, and, and, and uh, the NEL, the MRU, the Dietary Assessment Unit, um, and, and for all of their contributions and the volunteer services for um, all the recruitment and retention help. And some external investigators, as I pointed out, my collaborators um, and NPI, Dr. Susan Brissett and Leanne Redman, and finally, um, Caroline Blanchard and Rachel Silver, who are here on my team, and have been a great support for me. So thank you. So you and me. Yeah, Sai, thank you so much. We've uh, we've got questions coming in for you. So let me start with the first one, Larissa. How does long-term calorie restriction affect fertility? Have participants in calorie two experienced any reproductive problems? That is a great question. And uh, we did measure sex hormones and uh, sexual um, function, and we did not have any sort of detrimental or adverse effects in the sex hormones. Even a mild suppression was not observed. And the reproductive potential while during calorie, there were some that um, did get pregnant and had to drop out. And so after the active first year, um, not that that is a good case for um, showing that calorie restriction um, is is not uh, harmful for reproductive effects, but we did not document any detrimental changes in um, the reproductive hormones or, or in sexual function as self-reported for sure. But um, yeah, biologically speaking, the measured hormones were not adversely affected. All right. And the next question is from Alice. Um, should, what are the benefits observed in in terms of biological and aging measures related to the differences confirmed by weight loss versus calorie restriction versus time restricted eating and is it related to nutrient adequacy or absolute energy deficit that's a great question alice and uh, in calorie at least we made sure that we were absolutely um, sure not to confound the effects of weight loss versus caloric restriction this is why we had the two year period um, and, and, and during the two year period, we had the weight loss effects that we wanted to remove confounding from in the first year. And in the second year, basically they had reached weight stability and the effects that we were seeing is, um, are entirely attributable to 
the caloric restriction effects. And, and this is pretty much what we um, do see. And, and if we look at all of the metabolic benefits that were um, observed, especially for biological aging and attenuation, they were adjusted for the weight change. And so there was an independent CR effect that was over and, and, and uh, above or over and beyond the weight change itself, uh, which clearly pointed out to um, the, the impact of the, the intervention caloric restriction rather than the negative energy balance per se. Um, and this is not systematically addressed in other um, alternative approaches. They're doing it, but for calorie, um, the caloric restriction study, the randomized trial, we did um, adjust for the weight change related, um, you know, confounding and, and, and found an independent uh, contribution by CR. Does that answer your question? I think he's muted, but it sounds like it. Um, yes. All right, your next question is, are you aware of any progress developing CR memetics? Um, uh, hold on, another one's coming. Uh, and, and what this research tells us about the feasibility of creating them. As a nutrition scientist, I'd uh, prefer to stay within the domain of um, dietary interventions. Uh, there are definitely um, a variety of CR memetics that are being investigated at, at this point. And um, those are, you know, still, um, I think, in, in, in sort of a sort of testing stage rather than ready for prime time. And um, of course, you know, to sort of comprehensively have in one mimetic all of the multiple system-wide benefits that you would, um, you know, observe in, in calorie restriction through a dietary approach, um, it really requires, you know, a clear understanding of the, all of the mechanistic pathways. And so, yes, there are there are myomedics that are being investigated. Um, Rafa Cabo, their group, and the folks at Buck Institute are, are, are way more authoritative on, on in being able to comment on this. And um, I, I can say that the, there's definitely work that's done, being done, and um, I, I cannot comment on the benefits of one over the other at this point. All right, we, the questions are coming in. Um, one comment that has been made over the years is that CR is not restriction per se, but a potential reflection of actual diets in nature where animals cannot typically eat ad libitum. What do we know of pre-agrarian human caloric consumption and how that compares to modern CR methods? Yes, um, there's some work that's being that's been done um, uh, and and you know where they've com compared, sort of almost like the Paleolithic man um, to, to, to the modern day consumption and in relation to CR. Um, all I can say is that, you know, this again needs to be very carefully studied, not only for the overall um, intake, but also vis-a-vis -vis the energy requirements and energy expenditure, but um, also need to be studied with regards to diet composition, right? You know, we, we really don't have the answers to all of that. Um, and, and I think what you bring up is a, is a really good point. Um, and uh, for the work needs to be done, um, but Herman Ponzer and their group have started um, looking at, at factors pretty much like this. And, uh, and, and, and it's very hard as well to see what the contribution is from energy expenditure versus energy intake and, and carefully teasing out those two components of the energy balance to see what is the net CR deficit is, is, is a work that needs to be done uh, under careful conditions. Okay, uh, your calorie two study was conducted among people less than 50 years old. Um, if you, could you comment on the CR implementation or time-restricted eating? Uh, does it require unique considerations for the elderly, bearing in mind that malnutrition is common and may also contribute to the development of geriatric syndromes in older adults? Yes, that's a, that is a very important and, and, and uh, great question in terms of what are the considerations and caveats. We definitely um, had not only a younger cohort from 20 to 50 year, uh, years of age being the focus, but also um, they did not um, have, uh, you know, medication intake. They're, they were healthy by a variety of uh, measures. And so we, in older adults, need to be considering, um, you know, what are the medications that they are taking? Are, are they, do they, what are the chronic diseases that they present with? Um, and, and what are some of the, you know, challenges? Not, not every 70-year-old um, or 80-year-old is 
is the same. And so if there are you know, clear contraindications for um, caloric restriction, that would need to be you know, really um, considered more for nutritional um, status, prevention of failure to thrive, and, and other important uh, parameters uh, for health span rather than calorie restriction. So um, the one thing I can tell you is that the 50 to 50 plus um, age group is now, like I said, being investigated for um, CR and alternative approaches. Um, and the lessons that we learn from them can inform us more authoritatively. The considerations that are unique include, again, like I said, medication use, presence of chronic disease, uh, presence of other nutritional conditions that may coexist, um, and, and, and age as well, not just the chronological age, but um, their health span in relation to chronological age. Those would need to absolutely be considered. All right, we have three more questions. I'm sure we don't have time for more. Um, is the loss of lean mass observed in humans a concern? I would add to that is the loss of bone mineral density a, a concern. Yes, those um, the bone mineral density um, changes as well as lean mass changes were highlighted um, in, in calorie as, uh, as important considerations. They are certainly nowhere close to the types of uh, changes that are observed with the alternate day fast. However, that said, when we looked at the percentage change in lean mass um, compared to where the participants started, there was, as, um, as you will see in the, in, in the paper that I published on body composition changes with calorie, that lean mass was higher and fat mass was lower in the calorie restricted participants um, compared to when they started with us as baseline. So all, in this already healthy cohort, the percentage of lean to fat was more beneficial at the end of two years. In, in addition, um, strength related changes were not impacted when we look at the adjusted lean mass. Uh, the changes in lean mass, um, which include basically termed fat free mass includes water changes, bone changes, as well as the actual skeletal muscle mass changes, right? There were not detrimental changes at the skeletal muscle mass level, but these changes um, in overall fat-free mass when adjusted um, for um, you know, changes in strength showed that strength was actually increased rather than decreased. So it is definitely something that I wouldn't uh, make a sweeping statement that across the board would not be a concern, but um, it definitely um, is also not something that you know in this 20 to 50 year old population seem to be a huge uh, problem. All right, two more questions if we can fit them in Chris quickly. Sheldon says, studies in mice have shown an important role for genetics in CR. Was there any hint of possible genetic roles in human subjects and calorie that could explain some of the variation in responses? Yeah, um, child, uh, in the paper that Dan Bautsky um, and, and, and as published recently in Nature Aging, you will see that, you know, one is what he beautifully argues as a speedometer versus an endometer. The pace of aging is a measure that is more dynamic and, and, and essentially is, is a measure of the rate of, um, atten you know, attenuation of aging being decreased or not. And the other is more of a static measure. So what he um, calls an endometer-like measure, which is, you know, a snapshot, if you will. So what he didn't see is much of a change in, uh, he and we didn't see is a much of a change in the snapshot measure, but we did see the dynamic measure change. So I think um, that is the difference, the approaches uh, in, in how the methylation tag versus the, the biomarkers that I use are, are something that you will very easily comprehend, um, but that's the difference. One's a static measure, one's more of a dynamic measure and is a pace of aging measure. Um, and the pace of aging was actually attenuated. Okay, I think we uh, we need to stop our questions. There's one, I apologize. Say so thank you so much for a terrific talk, which, and uh, we had so many great questions as well. Um, you're doing great work. Please keep it up, and thank you all for attending. Thank you.